shrugs my shoulders My soul gets colder While we get older I have to watch As all my friends break down He's your buddy, when your brother is a jerk, he's your pal. When your dad is off at work, he won't leave you. When you go get a bite, at least until the sixth night. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who you gonna call? Psychic friend Fred Bear. He's a flower, for reasons still unknown, and he stalks you. On your way back home, he makes a promise that throws off all the lore. Seriously, Scott, what is this line for? And is it supposed to be in a slightly different yellow font here? Are you meaning this to be figurative or literal? Because if it's literal, you are opening up a literal can of worms. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who you gonna call? Psychic friend Fred Bear. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Psychic friend, Fred Bear. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where I start off today with a disclaimer. <clears throat> Warning! In entering this video, and honestly all of my theories, you are entering a ZONE OF SPECULATION! Where any idea is valid for consideration in the hopes that it solves more problems than it creates, answers more questions than it raises, or ties together dangling pieces of evidence in a narratively satisfying way. Am I trying to solve the lore? Yes. Am I doing it by asking really extreme over-the-top questions, looking into very specific details way too closely, and more often than not drawing connections between concepts that probably aren't connected at all? Absolutely yes. Side effects of entering the theory zone may include a blown mind, total and utter confusion, a deeper appreciation of your favorite franchises, fun stories to share with friends, a head full of random factoids that will at no point aid you in life, and disillusionment about human existence and our own place in the universe. Enter at your own risk. Disclaimers aside, theory crafting is a tricky needle to thread. A good theory is one that has enough evidence to support it, but not so much evidence that it's basically a known fact. It requires extrapolation, thinking beyond just the stuff that we're given, but not so far past that that you're overreaching or making baseless claims. And all of that while still maintaining a satisfying story. A story that stays true to the franchise that you're talking about while not being afraid to take that known story in new, often riskier directions. In a lot of ways, theory crafting is like writing fan fiction, just, you know, with more evidence. And, uh, less aggressive cuddling? A lot less aggressive cuddling than some of the fan fictions I've been exposed to over over the years. Anyway, the reason that I say all of this right now is that today's theory is... <sighs> How do I put it? it? It's one of the stretchier ones. Like, there are some theories that are rock solid. There's some really strong evidence in the game, and it's supported by stuff that's been said by the developers or creators. Then there are others that require a bit more creative license, where the connections are there, but they might require you to squint a little bit, or just, you know, have fun with it and go along for the ride. And this episode is one of those theories, because today we're once again diving into the world of Fetch, book two of the Fazbear Fright series. You see, last time I mentioned this. Fetch was really recently released and it is, um, well, if I'm being honest, it feels much less connected to the series than the first one. The connections to the main lore are definitely a bit shakier. This one, meanwhile, introduces us to a lot of new things. A smartphone-powered animatronic dog named Fetch. Tiny, free-roaming versions of Freddy Fazbear called Lonely Freddy's. And that felt weird to me. Every story of the first book felt very connected to established characters, from golden bunny suits to shape-shifting baby to Funtime Freddy. So why was this one, the second book, doing so 
so many new things. It felt like a pretty extreme tonal shift, especially considering Scott had just posted about how these books would fill in some of the blanks from the past. So then I thought about it, and I considered what blanks from the past this odd collection of stories might be trying to fill, and something clicked. I think that there's a chance that one of the new inclusions in this book is actually something that we've known about for a long time. An oddball character that's confused us and stymied our theories for years. I believe that there's a chance, a chance, that Fetch's Lonely Freddies may actually be the real identity of FNAF 4's psychic friend Fredbear. You remember that plush doll from FNAF 4 with the living eyes that tracked your movements as you walked around the room, that stalked you in the streets and disguised itself as a flower? The thing that could actually read the crying child's innermost thoughts. I think that guy was a type of Lonely Freddy doll. But to truly understand why I think these two are connected, let's begin with Lonely Freddy's story. To quickly recap this story in a bit more detail than I did last time because now the details actually matter for the theory, Alec is an angry teenager who's upset that his younger sister Hazel gets all of their parents' love and affection because she's practically perfect in every way. So when Hazel, just out of the blue, starts being overly nice to Alec and wants to join him in making their parents miserable, he doesn't trust her. He suspects that she's up to something, and so he concocts a plan to expose her for being a spoiled brat at her upcoming birthday party, which happens at, wouldn't you know it, the local Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. His plan, well, it's not a particularly good one, and if I have to fault this story for one thing, it's that the mechanics of how it all works is kind of confusing, so stay with me here. At Freddy's, they have this big money booth. You know, those clear boxes with fans that blow all these tickets around you, and you try to grab them, and you walk away with whatever you're able to capture in the booth. And in the booth, there's a special ticket that allows you to win the top prize in the restaurant. A Yarg Foxy. Basically a large foxy doll with extra hook-swinging action. Okay, so it seems like Hazel really wants to win the Yarg Foxy, so Alex sabotages her chances by taking out the special winning ticket before she gets in. Except, she does win. By some weird, magical, unexplained miracle, the ticket winds up in her hair, and she wins the Foxy doll. The twist, though, is that she didn't want to win it for herself, she wanted to win it for Alex. You see, Alex secretly loves Freddy's Pizzeria, but he never gets to have his birthday there. And of all the characters, he loves Foxy the most, even pretending to be Yarg Foxy around the house when no one's looking. But when Hazel tries to give it to him as a sign of friendship, as a way to try and finally make him happy, all it does is infuriate him. Once more bested by his perfect sister, Alec loses it, he rips the Foxy doll and runs off to the storage room crying. Once there, he meets a lonely Freddy doll, a small free-roaming version of everyone's favorite bear. The bear hypnotizes him and then body swaps with him, leaving Alex's consciousness trapped forever in the doll's body while an AI with his face roams free, unbeknownst to his family. So forgive me the detailed plot description, but I needed to get all that in because Alex's story, strangely enough, closely matches what we see happening in FNAF 4's Crying Child. Now, I don't think Alec is the crying child by any means. There are just way too many differences here, but I did want to call out how similar these two stories are because the parallels seem intentional. They seem to be inviting us to compare these two stories. So let's do exactly that. Just like in FNAF 4, there's a countdown. You're late, you're late. I gotta get him changed. to a birthday party happening at Freddy's at the end of the week. Though in this case, it's a sister's party and not his. Speaking of the sister, Alex's younger sister Hazel is described as being cute and perfect, with a lot of emphasis being placed on her green eyes and her curly yellow hair. An important physical description considering Elizabeth, the girl who would go on to possess baby and who we assume is crying child's sister and owner of this room in FNAF 4, is also blonde with green eyes. In fact, eye color is brought up a lot. An unusual amount throughout the Lonely Freddy story. Quotes like this. Alec had never noticed the bear's eyes before. Had they always been that blue? And again, its eyes were as blue and deep as an ocean trench. Over 13 times are eyes in this story qualified by their color, which is worth noting considering that a lot of the other short stories thus far in Fazbear Frights have had themselves pretty sparse character descriptions. But this one, for some reason, really chooses to emphasize the fact that Alec and 
Hazel have green eyes and that Lonely Freddy has blue eyes, which, if you have an obsessive level of knowledge of the series, should ring a few alarm bells. In Sister Location, eye color was a huge deal, so much so that I did a whole theory about it back when Sister Location came out, where the baby animatronic had blue eyes until she scooped Elizabeth and her eyes turned green. And here we have something very similar happening. Quote from the story, Alex stared hard into the blue eyes of Lonely Freddy, eyes that had burned through his soul, and he searched for answers of his own, but he only came away with more questions, because the blue eyes of the bear had suddenly turned a light green, end quote. And again, in this quote, all Alec could see was the bear as its newly green eyes bore through him. So we've got a party, a sister, and some eyes, but obviously there's gotta be more, right? Alec, when his plan fails, runs off to hide in the storage room crying, similar to the crying child being locked in the storage room in FNAF 4. And in general, Alec is just a sulky, moody kid who, similar to our crying child, both loves and hates Freddy Fazbear's. Alec, in the book, secretly loves the restaurant and its characters, but he also hates it because he only gets to go when it's for his sister, which makes him bitter and angry to be there. It's a lot like the conflicted feelings our crying child has for the restaurants, who clearly likes the franchise. I mean, he has all the toys in his room, and yet while he's there, he's clearly miserable. We're not exactly sure why, but he does have mixed feelings about this franchise. Kind of like me, that is hashtag relatable. I feel seen, crying child. But to me, one of the most telling connections between this story and the game is the Yarg Foxy toy. When Hazel tries to give the toy to Alec, Alec freaks out and rips the toy's arm off. It's a small detail, but one that immediately made me think of the Foxy that's in the crying child's FNAF 4 room. A Foxy plush with one very specific feature. A feature that has never, never, never gotten explained. Its head was pulled off. So we have ourselves two Foxy plushies, both with a body part ripped off in some way, in the possession of a kid who both loves and hates Freddy's, that winds up locked in a storage room crying, attends a birthday party, and has themselves a green-eyed sister with blonde hair. It is just an oddly specific series of parallels that are almost so precise, they're inviting us to compare them. It's actually a bit uncanny. Alec in this story is almost like a fusion of the crying child and his brother. You see, crying child, for all the reasons that we just talked about, but also the older brother because, well, he's a mean older brother to his sister, and his favorite character is Foxy, so much so that he pretends to be Foxy around the house, just like we see the older brother doing to torment the crying child in FNAF 4. Again, it's not exactly the same. There are plenty of differences between these two scenarios, but there are a lot of parallel details, almost like alternate universe versions of roughly the same series of events. So what does any of this have to do with psychic friend Fredbear? Well, I believe that all of these parallels with FNAF 4 are intentional. They're drawing lines between the two stories, inviting us to compare them. And when you do that, it becomes undeniable that psychic friend Fredbear is a Lonely Freddy. To understand why, let's start with the book. This is how Lonely Freddy is first described, quote, It was a weird name for a toy, but the weirdest parts of it were harder to define. The bear stood stiff, almost at attention. Its eyes stared straight ahead at the stage, but Alec had the strangest feeling that it was still watching him, end quote. So, a small Freddy toy with eyes that watch you as you move around the room. Definitely sounds like what Psychic Friend does as we maneuver our way through the FNAF 4 minigames. His white eyes just move around with us, wherever we go. We're also told that the Lonely Freddy is able to free roam in order to follow the kids around. Again, explaining why he shows up in practically every screen of the FNAF 4 minigames. It is literally designed to be a moving surveillance camera. I mean, maybe it can't disguise itself as a flower or whatever, but just chalk that one up to Scott's artistic license. Later in the story, we're told what the purpose of the Lonely Freddy is. Quote again, At Freddy Fazbear's, we believe that no child should have to experience the wonder and delight of Freddy Fazbear's family pizzeria alone. Using patented technology and a touch of that Freddy Fazbear magic, Freddy will learn all about your child's favorite things just like a true friend. Aunt Gigi leaned close to their mom. Is it just me or does Lonely Freddy sound like the cure for the unwanted kid? It's a mechanical last resort, as in no one wants to play with this kid, so here's a machine that'll do it instead. End quote. This is a device specifically designed to become a friend to sad like FNAF 4's crying child. Children just like Alec. 
And in a line again drawing parallels between the two stories, we get ourselves this, quote, If there was ever a kid who would have been foisted onto a lonely Freddy at a birthday party, it would have been Alec. Now, this is important. One of the strangest things about psychic friend Fred Bear in the game was his knowledge of crying child's innermost thoughts, saying things like, Remember what you saw, and he hates you. It's the whole reason I started calling him psychic friend Fred Bear in the first place. The toy's knowledge of what was going on inside the boy's head was just uncanny. Just one of the many strange things about this character. One of the many strange things about this character that gets an explanation via Lonely Freddy's behavior in the story. The bear approaches Alec in the storage room and starts asking questions. Questions that start to turn serious. Quote from the book, I've been waiting for you, friend, the bear said. We should be best friends. It's a stuffed animal, Alec told himself. It's a stuffed toy. What's your favorite color? My favorite color is green. What's your favorite food? Lasagna. Then the bear's questions took a different turn. What would you do if you were asked to hurt someone you love? It felt like the bear was reaching its soft plush paw into his very soul and extracting the answers he kept the most hidden. And it was doing it so effortlessly. So the Lonely Freddy is a stuffed bear designed to act as a surveillance camera on kids. Follow them around, talk to the sad lonely ones, and then extract information from them to become their friend before eventually body swapping with them. I mean, each and every one of those details, minus the whole body swap thing, is something that we see the psychic friend Freddy bear do. But there is one last detail that I haven't included yet. The Freddies are controlled by a man who works in a private backroom office. Quote again, the party prepper turned a dial on her hip-clipped walkie-talkie and pressed her finger to her headset. Someone get Daryl to do a Lonely Freddy demo. Daryl's on break. The fact that there's someone behind the scenes controlling these devices in the book is a direct callback to the secret private room from Sister Location. The one where there were surveillance cameras watching the FNAF 4 house, guarded by the password 1983. It was in that room that we saw a psychic friend Fredbear for the first and only time in a non-8-bit setting. There, on the desk, was a short little plushie with his white little surveillance eyes and a walkie-talkie right next to him, coinciding with this scene from the book. So, there you have it, friend. The official name of psychic friend Fred Bear is Lonely Freddy. It's not quite as fun, but I guess it's easier for me to type, so that's a plus. It's a camera system controlled by someone hidden in a back surveillance room. A system that has the ability to walk and talk and maybe even hypnotize and body swap. Now the question that we're left with is who was controlling it in FNAF 4? I mean, it seems like the obvious answer here should be William Afton, right? Who else would be doing it? But the bigger question is why? Why would he be doing all this just to watch what we assume is his own son. And then over in Bookland, the question is whether all of this is intentional. It seems like the employees don't actually know the true nature of these robots, so is this an AI roaming around? Or was a normal Lonely Freddy swapped out for one with body snatching abilities? That one seems like the most likely scenario, considering in story number three, out of stock, the plush trap chaser is swapped with an evil one with human body parts. So maybe William Afton or some of his people in this book universe are slowly seeding out evil animatronics into the world to run as little test cases. Also, since I'm wrapping up my discussion of fetch here, something else for you to chew on. At Hazel's birthday party, there's a girl named Charlotte. A girl who shares a name with the child that we know goes on to possess the puppet. A girl who, in this story, is allergic to chocolate and accidentally eats some and then spends the rest of the party vomiting. Could this actually give us an explanation for why Charlotte in the games would end up outside of the party, outside of the restaurant, when we see her in FNAF 6, before she eventually gets killed and turned into a puppet? It may be. It's just a thought that I'm throwing out there into the universe for everyone to pick apart. But with Fetch out of the way, it's time to look ahead. Because based on the descriptions, it's books number four and five, coming out later this year, that seem like they may hold the biggest lore reveals yet. In book four's description, we see that one of the main characters will have the name Susie. If she also has herself a dog, Susie is almost guaranteed to be confirmed as our fruity maze girl, and our first ever victim, the one who goes on to possess Chica. We also know that one of the book four stories will be about Pete and his younger brother who, quote, get in a fight in the wake of their parents' divorce and fall prey to a gruesome curse. Huh. Two brothers with divorced parents that have some blood curse on their family? Seems like it could be another stand-in for our crying child and foxy bro getting wrapped up in the cycle of serial killing their father started decades prior. And then, flipping over to book number five's description, quote, in room 1280 of Heracles Hospital, something evil is keeping a man alive. A man with gruesome burns all over his body 
and an iron will to live. Sounds a lot like our good old buddy William. Or it could be the aftermath of the FNAF 6's restaurant burning. With that being the last book in the Fazbear Fright series, I'd expect that one to tie up a lot of different loose ends. Speaking of loose ends, by the way, I hate them. That is why this show exists. To get rid of narrative loose ends. To tie them up. Put them neatly and organized back on the shelf. So you know what I really appreciate? What doesn't have loose ends? Wireless earbuds. No wires means no obnoxious tangling, which in turn means less stress. And it is a very stressful time right now, so I'll take less stress anywhere I can get it. And if you want to get yourself some top quality, stress-free earbuds, then I recommend our sponsor for today's episode, Raycon. Let's be honest, we're all stuck in close quarters these days, which makes privacy hard to come by. If you want to listen to a video in private, it's hard because someone's always nearby. If you want to listen to music while you work out in your room, someone is right there trying to work and your music is bothering them. It's times like this where having a quality set of earbuds really helps. You get to listen to what you want as loud as you want it while still being respectful to everyone around you. And the Raycon Everyday E25s are the best choice for all of your listening needs. First and foremost, they're half the price of any other premium wireless earbud out there, which I gotta say is incredibly important considering how tight money is right now. But even though they cost less, that doesn't mean that you're sacrificing on their quality. The Everyday E25s have more bass, they have more fun colors, they have a full six hours of playtime per charge, meaning that you're spending more time listening and less time with them being stuck in a charger. And at this point, as I literally pace aimlessly from room to room in the house looking for stuff to do, I just really appreciate the fact that they're the shape that fit and stay in your ears. I'm not having to constantly readjust them. Long story short, if you want portable privacy in these very claustrophobic times, Raycon delivers big sound at a not so big price. Plus, if you click the link in the description right now, you get 15% off your order, making that low price even better. Like I said, link is down below. Get 15% off your order. And Strong. 